was originally a national program. It has been going for over 25 years and it has unfortunately lost federal funding over the time and has split it off. It's got a good presence in Victoria, um, some outliers in New South Wales. And I'm proud to say it's doing really well in the ACT thanks to funding by the ACT government and Icon Water. We have essentially three objectives and that is to um, engage people on monitoring um, their waterways. We do a lot of work also in schools and in events around the ACT and the region, um, giving people awareness on different issues on their waterways. But one of my key roles, I suppose, is to take that data that we get from our volunteers and we are uh, and get that used, and get people um, actually using that data to better manage our waterways. So the main thing at the core of WaterWatch is our core set of a couple of hundred volunteers that have dedicated WaterWatch sites across the region. And when I say um, the region, of course, we've got uh, just, not just uh, ACT, but we've got YAS, Queanbeyan, uh, Cooma, and beyond. So we're talking on a catchment level, um, everything upstream of the Burrinjuk Dam and the Murrumbidgee catchment is what we monitor. Uh, we have volunteers monitoring uh, seven water quality parameters for us. We give them a kit. You don't need any experience. But you get a, a dedicated site and you go out monthly and you measure that water quality and you put it into our database. Uh, we also collect some other data like water bugs and riparian data and pipes and carp and I'll talk a bit more about that afterwards. But at the core of it is our, our, our water quality data and we house all that data in the Atlas of Living Australia database. And uh, we have currently over 29,000 records from the last 25 years in that database uh, and 232 active sites. So, you know, it's not, uh, not Michael's millions, but you know, it's getting there. <laughs> um, interesting little side story, I suppose, is when I started in this role seven years ago, I said, you know, what a great resource. I had actually been a Woodwatch volunteer many years prior, so I was aware of the program and what we did. Um, and I went up to the water policy people and said, so what are you using our data on? And they're like, oh, that's community data. And they had that little slightly condescending nod. And I was like, but we do a lot of work um, looking at quality assurance, quality control. Um, and they're like, yeah, but it, it, it's not professionally collected. And I was trying to argue this point and one of the fellows said to me, you know, you should compare it to the professional data and see if it correlates. And I went, that's a great idea, I think I'll do that. I'm sure you rude today, you said that. But um, I ended up going to the University of Canberra and asking them if they would do such a study for us. At the time, we had lost our federal funding, um, the Healthy Waterways Project, um, the five years of uh, Healthy Waterways funding from the SE government was uh, coming online and we were um, logging in, I suppose, to get our funding reinstated through that project and it was just um, more by chance than good design on my part that that um, report by the University of Canberra landed on our desk at that time to say what do you know there's actually some really good correlations there between the professional collected data and the community collected data um, this is um, also having these spatial and temporal scales that you can't get in a professional collected data we've got about 30 um, sites for uh, ASC government and we've got, as I said, 232 current water watch sites, um, about 180 of those in the ACT. And we have also just monthly data, whereas a lot of this data is collected on such a, a fine scale. So it's really um, brings a great level of detail that you can't pay for, or you could pay for, but you pay a lot for. Um, we also do a lot of work with our volunteers. Um, with, uh, they have to get accredited every year, so we do a water watch uh, workshop every six months. We get mystery solutions from the lab, and you have to go around each table and measure the, measure the um, mystery solutions, and we have a water watch staff member there who tests that you've got it right, and if you haven't got it right, we look if you've got you know, new batteries for your probe, or look sort of your methods, and so we um, actually look at that data then, and we feed back to the volunteers how accurate the data was to the mystery solutions and reminding them of technique and, and good procedure. And I'm a firm believer that if you have good fit for purpose methods and procedures, then there's no reason why a member of the committee can't be collecting equally as good data as the scientists in the white lab coat. Uh, so one of the um, other things we asked University of Canberra to do at the time was look at a way that we could report our data so that we could 
get it any used. Um, as I said, I didn't really get a sense that people were taking our data seriously and using it um, to a great degree. And so they came up with the um, a new refined version of our catchment health indicator program, or the CHIP as we finally call it. Uh, I have some copies of it that I'll gladly share around. You can take a copy home if you like. I'll be out when you're having drinks and your wine. Um, we just released, Mr. Gentleman launched our, our latest report uh, just last month for 2018. So, you know, the numbers are pretty impressive. Over 2,000 water quality records went into last year's report, 192 bug surveys, a couple of hundred riparian surveys, looking at the riverbank health assessments. Um, and we break them up into reaches, into um, individual sections of, of, of river. So for the Murrumbidgee River, for example, we've got about 13 report cards just for the Murrumbidgee, starting from above Tantangara Dam and Kosciuszko, and then in at um, Yass, um, at Burrenjup Dam near Yass. So you can actually go for a journey down the river, you look at the type of data that's collected, you get a score combining the water quality, the water bugs and the riparian, and you get a bit of an assessment of, of that year's health of the river. We've done four of these reports now, so the idea is that over time we could then look at trends in our data and things like that. And it's been hugely successful in getting people to actually um, look at the data. It's, it's aimed at a level that can be a good communication tool, but it means that um, catchment managers are actually using that data more, so uh, that's been a really great outcome. I feel one of the great benefits of the citizen science data is not just the valuable and very accurate data that they collect, but also the anecdotal evidence that they supply. You've got a couple of hundred champions out there on our rivers that go out every month and they're their eyes and ears, they're reporting litter, they're reporting illegal activity of various kinds. They are showing, um, they know if their site's got um, water quality that's not quite right, that they've been doing it for 15 years or more. Many of these people, um, many of them have been monitoring since the 2003 fires as well. We've had a lot of um, continuous people since then. So that's just hugely valuable. You've got these people with this long-term knowledge that can tell you if there's anything um, up. And I think last year that was really came to the fore in that we had a particularly dry year. Our, our chip scores were pretty much down all over the region and we put a lot of that to, it was one of the driest autumns and winters on record. But one of the things that really concerned um, the Water Watch staff was that the volunteers were saying, this is one of the driest I've ever seen this river. It's, it hasn't, it stopped flowing for the first time in, in 15 years. It wasn't even this dry at the end of the millennial drought, at the height of the millennial drought. So there's some really valuable anecdotal evidence um, across a lot of sites. And we put a lot of that down possibly to maybe groundwater recharge. And um, we just highlight the importance it is there is to good, um, opportunities to infiltrate um, the, the groundwater and to recharge groundwater and to make sure we've got good riparian areas that are connected to build resilience in our landscape because I think these extended dry periods are probably going to be more of a feature. Some of the other data we collect and one of our really successful projects is platypus month. August is platypus month. We do it in August because that's when the water bug numbers are particularly low. Platypus feed almost exclusively on water bugs and so they are much more active by the time you get into August because they have to spend longer foraging to get their quota of bugs, which they eat about a third of their body weight every day in bugs. Uh, so it's also a lovely way to test the metal of your volunteers, get them out on a nice cold winter's morning and let them stand still for an hour and, um, and see if they uh, you know, come back again. <laughs> uh, so we adopt the Australian Platypus Conservancy's group survey method where we have about a kilometre of stream. You have a spot along, uh, there's about 10 people along that kilometre stretch and you record every 10 minutes whether you saw a platypus or a ricali slash water rat, um, also a common aquatic um, mammal we have in our waterways here. Uh, so that's been really great. And last year we actually increased our number of surveys to 24 surveys. We do four surveys at each site. And again, in line with our chip, we had numbers consistently down across all our surveys last year. But interestingly, we had a peak in um, random sightings of platypus in Lake Billy Griffin in the same month. Um, and so we thought there's, there's a possibility there that the food source was down, as we know the water bugs were down, because we had surveys that supported that. Um, possibly the platypus are dispersing further outside of their normal range to forage for food. 
So while people thought it was a really great news story to find platypus all through Lake Griffin, and it was very nice, and don't get me wrong, I'm really pleased that people are watching, um, it might not have been necessarily a, a great thing. We don't think what platypus necessarily have resonant habitat in, in Lake Billy Griffin. But it was interesting that we had, you know, members of the public having these sightings in Lake Billy Griffin while we, while we were doing these surveys where we couldn't, we weren't finding them. So it was, um, it actually um, was an, it's an interesting theory and we'll keep doing those surveys and um, hopefully start to develop some really good trends. There's no other dedicated monitoring in of platypus happening in the region. So it's really very important that someone's watching. And another really great opportunity, an example of a, of a good opportunity, I think with citizen science, you look at um, uh, where is a really good fit for purpose. Fish are a really tricky thing to monitor unless you're a fisherman catching the fish. Um, how are people going to know what they're seeing in Murray Cod versus the goldfish, really? And uh, carp, though, we realised, have a really interesting behaviour when they're um, breeding in the springtime. They splash madly around the edges of the, of the river. You can see this, and there's still that, that classic splashing. That's, a, that's about seven carp just going nuts on the, on the side of Jerobomber Creek in Jerobomber wetlands. Um, and so we realised that people can actually hear it before they see it. They can hear carp splashing, and that's a unique behaviour in this region for, for carp breeding. So not only can you identify, anyone can identify carp, they can identify a carp breeding event. So there's a fantastic citizen science opportunity to raise awareness on pest fish and get some really good, um, useful um, information on where carp are breeding so that we, in theory, can better control them. Um, a nice virus would be good too, but we won't go there. Um, so in the end, it's been a really great success. Um, we've got a long list now of examples of where Water Watch data is getting used through government um, and beyond. The State of Environment reports will be coming out in June and they only use all the four chip reports that we've released so far in that report. We've got at least three monitoring programs in the ACT government that use the Water Watch data. The um, Coomba Monero Shire Council got a $100,000 grant to do restoration on Coomba Creek based on the platypus surveys and the chip report um, it was used as part of that application. So there really is a lot of great examples and this is definitely not exhausted this list, um, where people are really taking our data seriously now and we're becoming quite an integral part of a lot of monitoring programs. And I think that's really important as my role when you've got, I've got um, four amazing um, coordinators who work in the, in the catchment groups, the Southern ACT, Malongo and, and Jindera catchment groups, as well as um, up in Kuma. Now they're the people who are dealing with the volunteers mostly and um, they're the great champions in the community um, whereas I'm removed, I'm just the, 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 the ACD government person who's in there talking to policy and, and trying to ensure that this data is getting used and promoted. So it's a really great model where we've got this community independence to the, to the program as well. And I think it's been a really wonderful success. Um, and I hope it continues to be after June 30, <laughs> when our budget bid is due, <laughs> and pressure minister. Um, and so, um, yeah, thank you very much, and um, feel free to come and talk to me afterwards, over a glass of wine, if there's any questions you have. Thank you.